There's still some people coming in, but we don't want to we don't want to lose too much time. Mike is not working. Chris? Hey, yeah. Okay, this one is working. Good morning. Although some some participants are still entering, we, we want to get started less or more on time. So good chilly morning. You were lucky last year, these days, there was like a lot of snow. So now it's only chilly. It's okay. Um, it's my pleasure to, to introduce Janina. And I won't try to pronounce her family name because we can just say Janina. Janina is, is, is the, can I say the, 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 the technical brain or, or, or one of the technical brains, at least she has brains that she's steering um, of, of, of this EWP uh, project. And I think uh, the achievements um, that, that the University of Warsaw and, and the team uh, there did uh, are massive. And, and we are in a project, you know, and, and those of you who, who, who work in project, projects know this, this budget. Budget is always limited. But for Janina and her team, there's no, never an effort too much to, to make this thing happen. And, and I'm very happy that the, she will be, speak a little bit more technical, but she's one of those people that even if they, she has a technical background, she always looks at it from a user perspective. And I think that's a very important thing. She always asks questions to those people who might go very technical, but what about the IRO? Janina, what about the IRO? Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you, but you, you, you used five minutes of my time. Yeah, but okay. Uh, now I will have to limit myself. <laughs> but thank you for the nice words. Okay, let's, uh, let's get started. Uh, I will try to be not too technical, because I understand that uh, probably most of the audience is not prepared to look uh, or does not uh, see pleasure in looking into very technical details like XML files, XD schemas, etc., etc. So I, I will try to avoid uh, uh, terms like APIs, although I cannot promise that I will uh, be able to do that all the time. Uh, okay, so there is some agenda. Uh, I will, I, I'm supposed to explain you in a little bit more detail what the EWP network is and also what kind of plans we have for, for the coming year and the coming years. Uh, so let's start. Uh, what is the network? We are talking about the EWP network all the time. However, what exactly is it? First of all, in my opinion, it is the design. Des by design, I mean network architecture, protocols, services, uh, description of how that should work uh, and look like. And uh, to, to, to be honest, this design took us the most amount of time. So that was the most difficult part of the project to, uh, to find out how, uh, how this uh, technical backbone of the uh, network could look like. Uh, everything, whatever has been designed, is publicly available. So every one of you can go to GitHub and uh, uh, there is a special part uh, of GitHub which, is, uh, which belongs to the project and there you can find a lot of repositories with various pieces of the design and, uh, and much more. If you look at one of those uh, repositories you will see that there is always a readme part which is kind of a, a high level uh, description of what this uh, repository contains. There are also various flowcharts which describe the processes uh, that might be, I think, useful for less technically oriented people. And there is some stuff which is much more technical and, uh, well, maybe you will not enjoy it so much as your programmers. Uh, this everything is available, as I said, in the GitHub, uh, in the special part of it, which, is, which belongs to the project. What next? So we designed the network, and uh, the main part of the network, I would say the heart of the network, is the registry. Registry is kind of an address book, or yellow pages, 
we would say, in, in the US, uh, where you can find information about who is connected, where to find this, uh, uh, this partner, and what services are offered. Because uh, not, it, is, uh, it is quite natural that not all partners will be deliver all services. So they may decide by themselves what will be offered. Registry is, uh, an, uh, I would say, actively working in the network. Uh, it can rebuild its content automatically by itself. And uh, in fact, the only uh, moment where you are supposed to uh, share some uh, configuration data with the, uh, the administrator of the uh, registry is in the very beginning where you deliver the URL or the address of your installation and the list of hosts or institu uh, the list of institutions which will be covered by that host and that's it. And then you can change the information about your services on your own whenever you wish and the registry by itself will find out what you changed. So you don't have to, you know, contact administrator many times, just once. Uh, in fact, we have two uh, registries, one which is uh, the production and the other one which is for development network because before we will uh, accept somebody to the production network, we will have to, um, we will first, uh, uh, do our best to check that everything works. So we will do many tests on the develop, inside the development network. Also, what is important, eventually, the production work, the, because the production registry really has to be um, highly available, so 100% of time, we have to be able to access information which is there. So we will uh, design some solution which will um, assure us that the registry will always be available, like making many instances which will be synchronizing automatically uh, or, uh, or making each of the uh, production registers instances standalone and uh, rebuilding their contents by themselves. But this is yet to be Design. We, at the moment, probably we don't need such high av availability, but pretty soon it will be needed. Then, we already have the registry. Then we, uh, we need those who will be using the registry. We need uh, institutions. Institution is connected to the network by something we call connector. So the, there will be a piece of software which will be a kind of the agent of your student information system in the network. So your student information system via this agent will be connected to the uh, network. Uh, this uh, agent should uh, implement uh, at least some security protocols because the data has to be securely passed through the network and also it has to respond to the questions sent by the registry and because of that it has to uh, implement so-called discovery service or uh, we also call it manifest file. It may be active, it may be static, doesn't matter, it's up to you. However, the registry has to be able to send the question what services do you offer and give the answer back. So those two are a must. All the others are up to you. You may start uh, with something very simple, but then uh, add some more business-oriented APIs, those which will help you with your business processes in your uh, IRO. Uh, the construction uh, is uh, maybe, uh, there were, well, various institutions may, design, uh, may prepare their hosts in a different way. There may be one host hosting just one institution. However, probably commercial providers will be, uh, will be delivering or attaching to the network the host, which will cover more than one institution, as, as you see here. And uh, each of those institutions may deliver various numbers of APIs. So the the, the design is rather flexible and it's up to you whether you will be just a standalone host in the network or uh, you will be sharing the same host with other uh, institutions. 
the registry, as I said, will be uh, asking those hosts what services and what, uh, uh, what um, institutions are being served by that host. Uh, when you see the red in the top, it means a little bit more technical. So <laughs> some, of, some of you might just close your eyes if you don't like things like that. Uh, this, is, this is part of the content of the registry. So inside the registry, we have just the number of your, the list of URLs. And for example, you see this URL is uh, the address of my, uh, my um, host. And this is the content which is under this address. And the, well, it can be read. It's not that, that bad. Uh, f f look here, you will see the same address, and here you will see the information which institution is uh, being uh, uh, offering is offering its services at this uh, address, and here you see the the data of one institution, University of Warsaw. So the uh, the registry will keep this address, and under this address, the registry will find information. Okay, University of Warsaw is on the network, and the University of Warsaw delivers those services. And this is the list of services. Well, this is kind of a technical description, but uh, when you look at the address of the registry, you can do that. There is a web-based interface which can show you the list of services delivered by each uh, institution in a nicer way, kind of a table, whereas you, this list is much longer, and the, the, this is the list of services or APIs, and you can see immediately which institution supports which API. And you can also see that some institutions do not support some of the APIs, and that's fine. They may don't like them, or they may be delivering them in the future. So we have some services or APIs, which are uh, clear defined methods of communication between various software components. We have various APIs, though primary network APIs, which are for being part of the network, uh, general purpose APIs like institutions, organizational units. You have seen the presentations of those APIs in action yesterday during the demo session. There are also much uh, more mobility-oriented APIs for sending agreements, uh, outgoing and incoming uh, mobilities, nominations, uh, transcript of records, learning agreements, etc. And uh, we also have already the first set of MT Plus APIs, which uh, delivers us some public uh, data uh, from the MT Plus, so Mobility Tool Plus. Each API is relatively simple and can be implemented separately from the others. And it's up to you how you will implement in what speed and uh, whether all of them at once or gradually, one by one. Some of those APIs are for pushing the data, some are for pulling the data, so I may ask the partner, give me your institutional, uh, give me information about your institution and, and about uh, your organizational units. We also use something which we call notifications or change notification requests, and you have seen them yesterday in action. For example, when I produce, uh, I, I, I'm, there are some students outgoing from the University of Warsaw. Uh, uh, no, the other way around. There are some students coming from Porto to the University of Warsaw. Uh, at the end of the day, I produce transcript of records. So I click, I generate transcript of records, and the transcript of records is stored in my database. Then I send uh, the notification to the partner. Notification is like ding ding, something happened. I don't send the data at that moment, just notify the partner that the transcript is waiting. And the partner, at its own convenience, can uh, later on, at some moment, a day after, two days after, or a minute after, uh, send and uh, call another NPI and grab those transcripts of records to the local system. It may even happen that I will send five notifications and then the partner after some time will grab the, uh, those transcripts. So notifications is just an information that the data is waiting. 
So this is a, a very nice way of uh, talking between the system because, for example, you may, uh, your system or the system in Porto, after getting such notification, might either want for the human to push the button or can by itself grab those transcripts and store in a local system. And how you implement that, it's up to you. It's your local decision. So it can be less automatic, more, more automatic, uh, or it may change in time. So what else is the EWP network? A client part. I said already that we have design, that we have the registry, that we have the server site, and some of our partners started with the server side, not yet being ready with the client side. Because to, to have the client side, you have to really think uh, how your local processes go on and how they might be supported by some IT uh, procedures. Uh, so the, when you design your client, uh, you are designing the places or in your interface where you will put those EWP notification download buttons or buttons like get data from EWP or uh, anything else. Uh, so uh, the client is part of your user interface mostly. And uh, this is the most business oriented part and it really has to be designed with uh, your end users. Otherwise it will not make sense. Uh, so, how to be, build the node and uh, become connected? Uh, first, you have to implement the EWP connector or you can take it from the repository. Yesterday you have heard ab about Open Source University Alliance and uh, uh, you already have there two versions of uh, EWP uh, connector. Uh, so that easy part without those business processes, one from Porto and one from um, Aristoteles University in, in Thessaloniki. So you, can, you don't have to start from scratch. Then uh, when uh, this uh, connector is operational, you send your L to the registry administrator. This is a temporary address. Then you start testing. Uh, then you may implement other APIs as you go on with your end users and they all did tell you how to do it, how, how they expect it to work. Then you may update, when you add more APIs or services, you update the manifest file by yourself. And then those APIs become available. So you don't have to contact the administrator uh, more than once. And of course, uh, you should test as much as possible because, uh, well, you don't want to lose trust uh, in the network. So you really, if you are delivering, if you are exposing to the world some services, they, those services really have to work. Uh, and we will help you with that, but about that in a minute. So uh, yesterday you have seen a couple of user interfaces. They look differently, they have different colors, they, have, uh, they operate in a different way. And uh, in fact, uh, I think that uh, when we will be doing that part of uh, the project, uh, you should share experience with your clients, uh, with your partners, and you should uh, look for inspiration, looking what, how they implement various processes. And uh, this is not like spying, this is like really sharing experience. We are academic community and we know that when we share uh, both side profit out of that. So it's a, it's a good way of mm, going on. And when you are ready, you go to production. How to get help on a technical level? Those of you who will be responsive for the technical part will have to start with the developer's guide, which is available under this address. And uh, there you will find kind of a menu explaining uh, what services are, um, could be implemented and where to find the information in GitHub. So these are mostly links to GitHub. Uh, also, also uh, under this address, you will find some uh, extra tools which will help you check yourself that your 
software is running properly. First of all, there is uh, something we call Echo API validator. You can give URL of your installation, push the button, uh, well, even without just enter, and then uh, the thousands of tests go on, checking whether your software is running, and uh, uh, in a couple of minutes you get the information about each about the result of each of the tests, and it may be either success or some notice that something, well, it's okay, but might be done in a different way, or you get the information about the failure and the reason for that failure. For example, that in that particular case where some uh, parameter is missing, you should deliver um, such uh, error message and not such error message, things like that. So you really have when you implement, you really have to read the specification very carefully and really obey what is said there. Otherwise, you will be misbehaving. There is also a schema validator. When you send the data back to the client, to, to the partner, this data has to be prepared in a special format. And this format is also specified in GitHub. And uh, uh, you may, using this validator, you may uh, check that this format is correct before you start sending it to the clients. And uh, again, it, uh, it's, uh, it's quite nice if you do it beforehand and not start you know, pushing the data to your partner, which is not um, uh, properly formed. Uh, so, whenever you want to find something really technical, like uh, source code or examples of requests and the responses in XML, the schemas, uh, everything is in GitHub. So, uh, uh, and uh, well, under this address, you, you have been uh, shown on the other slide, you will find all technical stuff we have prepared for you. Uh, this is, well, I would say not so much technical. This is a flow chart showing the mobility process. And uh, I, I think that uh, even uh, that also people from IRO may profit from it. And definitely uh, this should help you talk with your programmer because you are the business owner. You know the business and they should prepare software for that. So you have to communicate somehow. And that, that diagram, for example, shows what exactly is going on when you exchange transcript of records with your partner. Who is, who is doing what and in which order. So exactly the flow of uh, information. Then this is part of the information you may find in GitHub. Uh, this part explain in detail what should you deliver when you ask for some information. This is the description of uh, Mobility Tool Plus Institutions API. Yesterday I demonstrated how it works, that I can, uh, I showed you that I could ask for the information about uh, Helsinki University. So uh, to ask the question, I have to deliver P, uh, P number so you know what it is, I'm sure. And these parameters are required. And I also have to deliver a date because, uh, uh, in fact, the, 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 the main purpose of this method is for getting Eche, um, Erasmus Charter number. Uh, and the, those numbers may change in time. So when you ask, you have also delivered in which academic year, which academic year you're asking for. And when you deliver this uh, uh, data, you will get in return something like that. Here you see uh, the peak number, uh, Erasmus code, uh, charter number at valid uh, in, uh, in uh, well, starting day and ending date for this charter number, the name of the university in, natural, in a native language in English and some address data. So. Uh, well, it is readable, I, I would say, and uh, your system will pass that, uh, uh, that record and can put that information into your database. But everything, as I said, can be uh, those descriptions and those examples, there are many examples in GitHub, so those examples should help you understand what, what is expected. Well, 
how to test. You can either use your own demo installation or you can use one of the demo installations of your partners. Uh, University of Warsaw delivers two installations, in fact, and uh, they are available under this address. And whoever writes an email to me asking for uh, authorization data, I will give it. I, we can share these uh, demo installations with you. So if you would like to try send the data from one of my installations to the other or from your installation to my installation, uh, these demo versions are available. Uh, and, uh, well, you can also get inspired by looking at uh, how we prepared that for our IRO, who is sitting there in the back. So what are the plans for the second year of the project? Uh, first of all, the, the main goal for the next year is to design this uh, uh, new MT Plus API everybody is waiting for, uh, the one which will allow us to report our mobilities to the Mobility to Tool Plus, not via, uh, you know, downloading the data to the f static file and then uploading the file to the uh, MT Plus, but doing it straight from the system to the system. Uh, this will be done in such a way that after sending each uh, um, Mobility, we will get in return the information back whether everything is fine and Mobility was accepted or or whether there was some error and we have to repeat the process. So, so uh, I hope that it will really make your life easier with reporting. Then the second uh, important task asking for, uh, waiting for us is great conversion. We know how to do it because uh, Agricon's project uh, not only built uh, standalone web-based application for uh, great conversion, but also has read an algorithm uh, on how to do, uh, showing how, how, how it can be done. So we will reuse that algorithm, but will allow you to send the, get the grade from the partner and either convert this grade locally or ask your partner to, uh, to convert that grade uh, at uh, the partner's site. Either way uh, may uh, work. We will be designing it pretty soon. So if you would like to have your opinion, uh, give us your opinion, just join the discussion. Then we also think about other uh, services which might be of use, like sending transcript of records without uh, the mobility context, by which I mean that we would like to send the transcript without beforehand sending nominations. It may happen, for example, we may want to send transcript to some uh, free movers um, institutions, not necessarily those who are part of the Erasmus Plus project. And in, in that wish, respect, we might want just to send transcript without, uh, pr without exchanging nomination, uh, nominations earlier. We also think, because at the moment, uh, transcript of records is only uh, the only place where we deliver the data and uh, the embedded PDF. But we think that also learning agreements, it might, be of, it might make sense to send the learning agreements as data and additionally as PDF to, to, to just be able to display it quickly. Uh, also, we think about uh, preparing some extra methods for handling uh, sets of courses which are exchanged between uh, institutions to make it easier for a student to uh, work on a, uh, on a learning agreement. Also, we plan to add much more uh, automatic testing so that not only ECHO is tested, can be tested automatically beforehand, but also the other APIs. So we are working on that and pretty soon um, we will um, be expecting that every partner will go through all the automatic tests before the partner will be accepted to the production registry. If you would like uh, to be part of the design process, you should join us as soon as possible. Do not wait. Uh, look at uh, what is described in um, GitHub and uh, uh, tell us which, uh, which scenarios are missing, which data uh, you would, which extra data you would like to um, exchange, etc., etc. We, we really need the opinion of partners to 
go to, to design it uh, properly. What are the other plans? We think about uh, exchanging diploma supplements. In case of transcript of records, we use a so-called ELMO format, which was uh, designed in, during uh, one of the other um, digitalization projects of the uh, Commission, MREX. And uh, soon the ELMO format will be upgraded to the new version, and this new version will support diploma supplements. So this is also possible that we will be uh, exchanging diploma supplements if there will be the need for that. Uh, also, we s start thinking about, well, maybe uh, universities might, might also deliver some publicly available data, like uh, MT+. Uh, of course, when we send nominations, we send them to particular partner. However, we might have in our repository a set of nice data which uh, might be interesting for your partners or anybody, like some uh, statistics for ranking providers or some global dictionaries. Uh, um, universities are usually very pr proud of the achievement, so if that achievement would be described in some more formalized way, uh, those ranking providers might just grab those information from your server without disturbing you and asking you in person to, to deliver that data. Uh, then uh, we think about uh, uh, using the registry for some other uh, purposes, for, offer, for, uh, for delivering information about the services of the other projects, like ESMO, this is a project which is ongoing, and uh, it uh, integrates education sector service providers to the EID, uh, EADAS network, giving access to education domain-specific attribute, whatever that means, they want to serve the academic community, so uh, their services might also be posted in the uh, uh, registry. MREX is another project which gives students access to their academic achievements and could also be exposed by the same registry, as well as European Student Card, which uh, well, should be interested in getting uh, information about the status of the student at home university. So, we really think about integrating digital services for the academic community into one network, available via one address book. What are your tasks? If you are a lucky user of one of the demonstrated softwares, you can start gradually incorporating EWP services to your daily routines. Just not, uh, no, it shouldn't be like that you go home and forget. You go home and start using uh, the services which have been prepared for you. Uh, you share your experience with your partners. You tell developers what are your needs and priorities. You shouldn't assume, okay, there is, not, there is no service I really need, so I will forget about that. No, you should not forget, you should go and ask for it. You should encourage your partners in mobility to join the network because, well, to exchange information you need the, the other part, otherwise you know, there is no fun with, when you exchange information with yourself. So you should get ready for the new Erasmus uh, Plus program and uh, it would be nice if we would uh, um, be able to interconnect all uh, holders in the coming years. Uh, well, about sharing experience, yesterday uh, in the evening uh, we were uh, talking with, um, with uh, I was talking with uh, my colleagues from the University of Warsaw and we thought that maybe it might be a good idea to organize something like EWP Network STT Week in Warsaw, just for those who are part of the network and who would like to share experience with the other partners, uh, who would like to uh, get the online, uh, hands-on training uh, with the uh, solutions ready and just, uh, well, start cooperating using the network and uh, we will probably invite you to such a week uh, maybe during the spring because Warsaw is quite nice in spring so early spring you may expect uh, invitation to the University of Warsaw and that's it thank you
no time for questions. We keep them for the coffee break because we also need to talk about how to join the EWP network in practice. Um, and I, I will talk about joining the network because EWP, as you already uh, saw during uh, the last day, yesterday and also today, it's a lot of things. It's an umbrella for a lot of things. So it's a project. I won't talk about joining the project, but I will, I will talk about joining the network, the thing that, that Janina just explained. And later, Stefan will also give you uh, like, uh, an overview as how we try to, to, um, to, to have EWP as a, as a hub for a lot of digital solutions. Um, I won't focus on that, so my presentation will be about joining the EWP network with your institution. Um, first of all, it's very important to understand the situation in your university, and that's something that each of the individual institutions will need to look into. What's my situation? Do I have software prepared by my own institution? Do I use commercial software? Um, Maybe I use Excel sheets whatsoever, so that, that, that will be a, a crucial question. And then secondly, I will, I will talk a little bit about the two-tier uh, admission uh, procedure where we have a level of authentication and uh, as well a level of technical admission. And uh, Janina already uh, referred to, to different tools that we have in order to do automated testing, but also testing with, with some demo installations in Warsaw or, or, or with other partners. So that will be the, the, the outline of the presentation. And I start with a slide, I'm sorry for that, um, once again, but of course um, we need to repeat important messages. Um, so this is the picture that came from the DISC research about the current situation um, in higher education institutions. Some of them are using uh, commercial software, some of them are using no specific tools, there's in-house developed systems, there's a small uh, number of institutions indicating they had other solutions. Now, let's look at Erasmus Without Paper, which is now seen as the network, which is the central thing, the phone book, where we need to connect all those different systems. And then we have those institutions that don't have any specific IT tools. We have some institutions, and it's not really commercial, it's, it's, it's more um, student information systems. Um, developed for a consortium of universities. We had some examples yesterday, like the one with Sigma, uh, the one from Warsaw. So, so they are not strictly commercial, it's also not in-house, it's like a combination with an association of universities, joining forces, developing software for a group of universities. Which makes sense, because you can like cut some costs, but of course, you also lose some flexibility. It won't be 100% tailor-made. But that's of course always the case with uh, software development. Um, we have the in-house student information system that caters with uh, um, uh, mobility as well. And then we have the commercial providers. There's tools available on the market that you can use to manage your mobilities. And for you, it's crucial to know where you are in this picture. Um, under the umbrella of Erasmus Without Paper, uh, it, it has been uh, explained by Daiga yesterday during the presentation, there is the Erasmus Plus, uh, Erasmus Plus dashboard. Um, in this dashboard, uh, which is already up and running, like we saw yesterday, um, Erasmus Without Paper want to cater for those universities that don't have an IT solution yet in order to manage their mobilities. The Erasmus um, Plus dashboard will then be, be connected to Erasmus Without Paper, that's also on the list uh, for 2019, in order to be able to communicate. They can consult the phone book if they want to, uh, for example, an institution using the Erasmus Plus, Plus dashboard, cooperating with Warsaw, they will go to the network and they will see, okay, University of Warsaw is using this system and that's the MUCHI uh, consortium uh, system, USOS. So they use the uh, SIS develop, developed for, for a consortium. And we already saw that we can exchange yesterday live um, even between uh, those types of, of institutions we can exchange. Um, 
those are, all, are at the moment already part of Erasmus Without Paper Network. So there's the, the MUCHI uh, consortium with Polish higher education institutions. We have uh, CERES in, in Norway. They cater for the whole higher education sector in Norway. Um, we have Sineke, Seneca in Italy. They, they are uh, also uh, representing a lot of higher education institutions in Italy. So if you're an Italian institution using this software, you need to talk with them and not with us because they provide the software for you. We have Sigma, that, that was already mentioned. So all those um, software providers can communicate via the EWP network with each other or with a dashboard or with in-house sys developed systems like the ones we saw from Ghent and from Porto. Uh, and then of course we have the, the commercial players. We're already now move on and, and mobility online. You saw it yesterday live. They already developed a lot of APIs. You can already use the functionality. Um, but there's also other players on the market that, that are already at the moment, they, they, they are um, developing the ECHO. Eh? This is one of the technical parts. It's, it's the hello world thing where, where you can show I'm live, I'm here, I can, I can connect to the network. Uh, so so Teradota, um, Osiris and Solonovo, and, and, and they will also be uh, invited in one of the panel discussions later on today. Uh, so, so they also uh, are, are, are uh, eager to implement the functionality that is needed in order to join Erasmus Without Paper. So if you know from this picture where is my university, of course the next step is am I eligible to apply for uh, Erasmus Without Paper or, or to join, it's not for applying, it's joining Erasmus Without Paper. Now I want to take one step back. Um, yesterday we tried to explain Erasmus Without Paper starting from concrete use case uh, scenarios and, and we have a few of them you, you probably all know the administrative processes for Erasmus um, Plus um, the idea is that like Janina al already pointed out we have a menu of API's and all those API's are catering for one two some of the processes uh, for example very simple one interinstitutional agreements this is a specific API if you implement this API you can join the network now it, it, it gets a little bit more complicated because I can imagine a situation where you use different solutions for different processes. Transcript of records might be part of your student information system, but you use the whole other functionality of a commercial, of a commercial software provider. So there is a possibility that, that, that you have, you use the dashboard for learning agreements, you use something different for other processes, and, and as Janina explained, by having the menu of APIs and having the phone book, that's crucial, having the phone book, we can cater for that. So in the phone book we know for transcript of records, we need to go there in order to have the data. Now, very important when it comes to what types of institution can join the network apart from mobility tool? They, they have a bit of a special status, of course. But in general, we want to exchange information for now. So we first focus on Europe, and then we had this panel discussion yesterday that we're open to the world, but first make this thing happen inside the, the Erasmus program with the program countries. So first of all, there's a check. Is this an ECHE charter holder? If you don't have an ECHE charter, you're not entitled for Erasmus Mobility. So this is the first check. I'm quite sure that everybody in this room uh, that represents a higher education institution has an ECHE char charter. Is this institution owner of the SHAC code? And this is something technical. It's not very, um, I mean, it, it's just a URL, but it needs to be, uh, you, you need to own this URL. I can't say, uh, hey, this is my SHAC, University of Warsaw uh, URL because it doesn't belong to me. So this is crucial. We need to know for sure that the information you provide is owned by your own uh, institution. And then 
do you own the manifest file? The manifest file, Janina explained already what it was. It, it, it's this file that describes which APIs are supported by my university. And the manifest file, it could be hosted on your own uh, university server or at the, the software provider. So if you're using, for example, commercial uh, software from, from MoveOn or from Mobility Online or from one of, one of the other players that, that, that are about to join either Erasmus Web Paper, the manifest file should be hosted there. So this, this, this are three simple checks, some information you need to provide if you apply or, or, or if you want to join. Um, and, and then if this is okay, the authentication part is dealt with, we go to the technical admission. And in the technical admission, we need to make a distinction between the new software providers and what we call trusted software providers. Trusted so software providers, for example, but I'm maybe first talk about the new software providers. Uh, so, so, so these ones are new in the network. They haven't been involved in Erasmus Without Paper. Um, each of you having your own student information system. Uh, for managing mobility and you think okay we want to join the network you will join as a new software provider and you will need to um, first of course be added to the development registry because we always test before we go to production um, inside uh, the services that Janina already explained there's there's some automated self tests where they can paste code it, it's been validated it's, it's been it's been checked if it works or not. And then the idea is that you test with other partners. As we already have um, Mobility Online, 200 clients, um, uh, MoveOn, 300 clients, the Polish higher education uh, institutions. So we already have 400 to 500 universities. I'm sure that most of you already have a partner that is inside the network via those uh, Erasmus uh, paper project partners. So the idea is that you, you test. There's a small report about the testing, like, okay, one of, one of the partners of Ghent University want, wants, to, wants to join the network. They developed the institution API. You ask me like, hey, can, can, you, can you fetch the data? Do, do you, if I change a contact, if I add a contact, does it come true? Like yesterday, might have gone wrong. In the end, it went good. Um, but that's the idea. So you have a report, tested it with three partners, and then we will finally do some, some technical testing by the competence center as a final step, just to make sure that you're ready for production. For the trusted software providers, they already went through this process. If an institution using the USO system in Poland wants to join the network, we only do the final step. Always, we need to do the final testing. Before going into production, we need to make sure that it works. And then, you are added to the EWP registry, and then you're part of this network in production. But of course, once you go to production, we need to be aware of what happens. If we're in production, and I click this button on nominations, then I nominate my student to, to Porto if they're in production as well. So this is very important to understand. Once we take this step, it's happening. Erasmus without paper is happening already. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. Just make sure everything works and, and test it as, as much as you can. Um, the responsible authority for, for, the, for the authorization for now is the steering committee of the Erasmus without paper project but of course this project comes to an end in December 2019 we will work on sustainability of course and, and, and we had clear um, hints from the European Commission that this is important I'm, I'm quite confident that there will be that there will be some follow-up funding projects whatsoever um, but we can't of course for now engage for any uh, commitments beyond 2019 so what we will do throughout 2019 is also start a dialogue with all stakeholders involved European Commission national agencies individual institutions on how this process could work in the future 
there, there is a risk assessment. And, and Rick was, was yesterday already referring to trust, and I think trust is crucial. Not only we need to trust the data that we receive from our partner universities, we also need to trust our own system. We need to trust the system of our partner universities. But of course, you're in charge. You decide who, who your partners are. And this is, I think, it adds another level of, of partner management um, in order to, to make sure that you exchange the data with the partners uh, you want to exchange it. It, 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 it. it goes beyond individual academics knowing each other from now on. There's an additional layer of trust needed in order to make the system working. And it's not because academics have a good working relation that this kind of things will work as well. So, so I, I would say that, that Erasmus Without Paper adds an additional layer of partner management into the program, which is a good thing, by the way. Um, of course, there's some potential problems as well. Maybe the APIs won't work. Yesterday, luckily they did, but you can't imagine how many uh, testing we did before coming live here on stage. Server might be offline which is also a problem because we send CNRs and nothing happens. Or we try to fetch data, nothing happens. So uptime of servers, it's very important. We might get, receive incomplete or inconsistent data. Um, maybe it's not a trustworthy partner. So if we get complaints, and probably if you have all those problems and you're exchanging with four or five universities, there's not one university that will complain. There will be many universities that will complain then the, com the competence center can decide to temporarily say, okay, we take you out of production and you get back to working and development, making sure that everything works, showing that it works, having the, 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 the testing with partners again and the report in order to be admitted again in this, in this uh, production registry. Um, I think Stefan already um, referred to the competence center yesterday which will be the main um, support tool coming from uh, the project, um, where you will find a lot of documentation about the different tools, the different situations that are happening at the moment. Uh, you can also find on the website a description of, of, of the different uh, solutions that, that we started with, because once again, that's crucial. You need to understand what's my situation. Do I use do I, don't, do I have a tool or not? Which tool do I have? Is it commercial? Are they already part of the network? Is it commercial? Are they not part of the, of the network? Then it's also good to like kind of bring them in contact with the Erasmus Without Paper project because of course it's in all our interest to have as many players uh, involved as possible. Um, and then the competence center will prov provide you with some tools. Your, if you need to develop your own um, APIs, uh, Janina already referred to, to GitHub, there's a, uh, a specific site, developers.erasmus.paper.eu, uh, which, which took me some time as well to understand, but I think it, there's, there's a lot of information. I think uh, from the technical perspective, um, I'm quite confident that, that you can have your IT people somewhere two days reading everything that's there, uh, trying to understand. and. and Many of us already understood, we already implemented it. It, it, it was clear yesterday that it works. Uh, so now is the time to identify your, your situation and, and to get the thing running. Um, stay informed, go to the website, updates about uh, the competence center, we, we will build on what we have now. You have information on how to join, you have information on the different situations. So this is the main entry point and of course we also have uh, the Twitter uh, account and the LinkedIn group. And I think probably many of you are, are already part of, of, of the LinkedIn group, Erasmus Our Paper, but I think it's a good uh, channel in order to, to, to spread messages about this project, about new developments in the competence center, added content. So if you kind of follow up on those uh, tools, you will be informed about the progress we make and, and about uh, if, if we connect the dashboard with Erasmus Our Paper, of course, we will try to inform you, but still, uh, there's also a responsibility for you um, in order to, to, to it's a two-way two, um, uh, matter of communication. 
So thank you. I hope I one one more thing. I, I didn't include any email address at at this stage. And and it can be very frustrating, you know. Help desks they tend not to have email addresses. It's it's more of a practical thing. We will have of course an email address join at erasmus.paper.eu something like that, but we will communicate it uh, via the website via our channels uh, because we it's very practical we still need to decide on what, what will be the email address? So that's something we, we can work on this afternoon. I pass the word to, to Stefan, who, who will uh, talk a little bit more about another piece of Erasmus Without Paper as an umbrella. Um, Erasmus Without Paper, Paper as an umbrella for digital solutions. You. Yeah, you can take this one out for a second. Technique. Ah, oh, yeah, perfect. Uh, could I ask the colleagues uh, Jean-Paul Romigas and Christina Elmer also to join me on the stage already? Which one is it? Either with the PHA. Okay, we're all set up. Perfect. So, wonderful good morning to all of you. I had to uh, stretch a little bit in the morning. We went back to Brussels yesterday evening and came back very early, so I'm a bit tired. But uh, I think it's good. Now I'm on the stage. It always uh, makes you awake. I hope you all had a great evening in Ghent yesterday. Who had a great evening yesterday? Who had a boring evening yesterday? <laughs> Someone very shy in the back. I, I saw, I will not point out who it was. It was a bit boring in the hotel. Okay, good having you all here. Um, as you can see on the screen, uh, we will talk about Erasmus without paper. And the topic is not uh, a statement, but rather a question. Is it a hub for digital solutions? And I have two very distinguished uh, speakers with me today. Um, this is Christina Elmar from UNIT, which is a Norwegian, well, you will know this better than I do, the Nor Norwegian uh, Directorate for ICT Tools and Services for Higher, for higher Education. education and research, a very big uh, uh, agency that is under the Ministry of uh, Education and Research in Norway, and Jean-Paul Rumigas, who I think many of you have seen yesterday already, uh, who works with the European Student Card Initiative and also with, well, is uh, working for the CNUS in France, so the, the French uh, student services. Uh, so we want to answer the question whether Erasmus with our paper can be a hub for digital solutions. So I want to start off with saying that in the last five years, we have uh, had this idea, or five years ago, we had this idea of Erasmus Without Paper. In the last three years, we have had two projects for Erasmus Without Paper, and we started developing a lot. And only yesterday, we launched the Erasmus Without Paper network officially. But a lot of things has ha have happened already in these last five years. And a lot of projects have already joined, or are about to join, or are sort of in the process of joining Erasmus Without Paper. Because Erasmus without paper is so much more than what its name is suggesting and the initial idea we had. A quick reminder, Janina met this, did this in a much more technical format. Erasmus without paper is actually something very, very simple. It's a registry and it's a data standard in very simple terms. So it's a registry which is like a telephone book where I can check who is already part of Erasmus without paper. And it is a data standard for mobility related data so that we can compare data system to system. So that means if you have an address and you have street name and number and another system has street name and then a different field which is a number, these systems need to understand that this is the same data. So this, that's why we have a data standard. Very, very simple. Now, in this session, which is going to be another 25 or so minutes, I want to introduce to you, together with my colleagues on the stage, some of the projects that have already collaborated or are collaborating uh, in the very near future with Erasmus Without Paper and hopefully answer the question whether Erasmus Without Paper can be a little bit more. But we will come back to this later. 
Let me start with a project that Janina already mentioned. I think it was already mentioned a few times. A project which is called EGRACONS, European Great Conversion Systems. I like to make things concrete. Do we have any French people in the room? Any French people? Yes, down here, up there. Let me ask, what is the grading scale in France? 0 to 20. We have a colleague here that knows as well. So how many percent of your students get a 20 or a 19? Zero percent. Maybe 0 0.01 percent. 0 0.01 percent. Now, do we have any Italians in the room? Some Italians over here. What is the grading scale in Italy? To 30. How many people get a 30 or a 29? A lot, a lot, a lot of people. Now, I am a French student, and I, I'm a very good French student, so I regularly get a 16 or a 17, which is great. It's a really good score in France, right? Now I go to Italy, and I get a 30. And now I come back. So what does, do the French do now? Do they give me a 20? What, what do you do at your institution? You give them a 20, a 16, a 17? It's di difficult to say. So, this dilemma we have all over Europe. We have different grading scales, and of course, different grading scales also mean different grades. So sometimes, good students are decouraged to do Erasmus because they might go to a country like France where they do very well and they just get 16 or 17 points out of 20, and then they come back home. And maybe in Italy, they were used to get a 30, but now, you know, they didn't get the full point, so maybe in Italy, they get something worse. So, there was this project called EGRACONS, which did grade conversion. Now, this tool was an external website where you had to upload your grading tables, where you had to provide the distribution of the grades at your institution, divided by faculty or department, depending on you know, what you upload. And then you could have some automatic translation. So you could say the, the top 10% in your studies would get the top 10% also in the other field. So you would really very fairly convert grades. Now, this is very complicated. So we want to integrate EGRACONS, this project, this idea of great conversion in Erasmus without paper. Even though it's not a very obvious use case for an administrator maybe, because it's more an academic uh, item of the, of the whole mobility process, it's very important to have the great conversion as part of it. So Erasmus without paper already serves more than just the normal mobility process, but could serve also great conversion. So it's the first use case that I wanted to share with you. But now I would like to uh, ask maybe Jean-Paul Rumigas to tell us a little bit more about the European student card. And I think we have a small video. Paul, do you know if the sound works on the... I can use my, my computer. It works. Yes, our technician says it works. So maybe we'll, we'll just put uh, the video. So while um, we open the video, the European student card, we'll see a small video which will give you an idea. Is already collaborating now with Erasmus with our paper and is part of the project itself. John Paul, maybe a quick introduction, and then we'll see the video. Thank you, Stefan. Yes, uh, Erasmus World Paper and uh, uh, European Student Card, we are a very close partner from the beginning. I, I must say, you know, you know, we are a project funded by the EU, and before we started our project, we 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 um, uh, got. Uh, in touch uh, through the European Commission. So I want to thank all of them first, uh, the European Commission and our partner from Erasmus Without Paper because uh, they have been in all our meetings and we are now uh, partners in Erasmus Without Paper too. And uh, so it's very important to say that, uh, that all uh, those projects are very uh, uh, close partners and it's important to uh, say that all of them are trying to make your life easier if you are, we're talking about uh, mobility. So here you can see the website of our project and um, uh, it's, a, it's a, everything is there. So we have a, a short time today but uh, you can get all the information on this website. We have a, a, a YouTube uh, channel and I want to show you the simplest way to uh, explain what is the European student card is just to show you this uh, short uh, film. Since autumn 2015, 
The European Student Card Project has grown and become established between different student service networks in four European countries, France, Germany, Italy, and Ireland. Its goal? To provide a European dimension on the current student card, thus facilitating student mobility. The European Student Card is not a new student card, nor is it an additional student card, but simply each institution's current student card, adapted to take on this European dimension. Student card ownership remains unchanged, with each card still issued and owned by the higher education institutions. During the pilot phase, the partners involved in the project implemented a digital platform that allows the exchange of student data between information systems of the higher education institutions. Each card manufactured has a card number on the platform, called European Student Card Number, or ESCN. This number, printed on the student card as a QR code, allows the higher education institution to check the status of the student. A European Student Identifier, or ESI, is created, using the student number of the student's home institution as a base, with additional elements added to ensure each ESI is unique across all HEIs. The database requires only three elements, the European Student Identifier, the ESCN, and the student's email address. The email address can be removed or modified by the student, thus guaranteeing the protection of each student's personal data. The student has full control over his personal data, even if he opt-ins initially, and his data has been sent to the platform. The student can decide to remove his data at any stage. The ability to verify student status facilitates access to different services, which is useful for the student mobility. Three types of services have already been tested and developed during the pilot phase. Access to the university's library and book borrowing. Access to market services through an electronic payment system that allows payment in the university restaurant, laundry, vending machines, photocopiers, etc. and the digitization of every administrative papers. All data exchanges are done digitally and securely. The Erasmus program in particular will be completely digitized thanks to the Erasmus Without Paper project. To recognize a student card as a European student card, a visual element represented by a holographic logo is printed on the card. The presence of this logo means that the student has become a European student. The QR code, which holds the ESCN, allows the service provider to query the platform easily and check the student's status. This can be done in all European higher education institutions, regardless of their card technology. This information can also be stored on the card chip, just as the case on credit cards. This way, the student card takes on a real European dimension. It allows easier cooperation between higher education institutions and provides access to specific services and discounts for all students in the institutions that take part of the project. Thanks to the European Student Card Project, the student card becomes a passport to travel easily in the European higher education area. So, uh, I think this uh, is a good uh, summary of the, of the project. Uh, I would say that, uh, as um, uh, Vanessa de Biesenton said yesterday, you know the EU leaders uh, in Gothenburg last year, uh, at the end of uh, 2017, uh, 
just uh, stated that for them, the two priorities for higher education in, in Europe uh, were the European Student Card and uh, uh, doubling the Erasmus Plus project. So it's a, a very, uh, uh, let's say, a, f a project uh, that all uh, uh, policymakers uh, consider as a, a priority in Europe. Then we had uh, last uh, month of May in Paris the ministerial conference of the Bologna process and the 48 uh, ministers of the Bologna area stated also that the European Student Card has to be uh, generalized in Europe. So the project started in 2016 and, uh, the, and finished uh, as a strategic partnership funded by the EU uh, uh, last September. And the generalization of the card has uh, started, of course. Here you, you will see in, on the website the different countries already connected, the different institutions. We have 45 institutions, but the process is uh, starting. Eh? For instance, Next year, 100% uh, of the French university will be connected and will issue cards with this uh, logo. Uh, and you will see here also on the website the different services we already tested and we, we are going to uh, connect to this recognition of the student ID uh, thanks to the card. Uh, we have here different university uh, which are already implementing the card. For instance, we have colleagues from the University of Normandy. Uh, can you, yeah? And uh, they uh, also, they can, uh, uh, perhaps after, you, if we have a debate, they can uh, say a, a few words. Uh, it's important to mention that they have with them also staff cards, not only for students, because it's the same. Uh, technology, so they have the cards, and the mobility of the, per the personnel is also uh, very important. We have the University of Grenoble, also, which is one of the leaders uh, of the project in France, and also uh, working uh, closely with Erasmus or with that paper. So, this is a, a, a very important uh, point um, to mention that we started the generalization. What we e what we do is the the it's, uh, the, as you, you could see in the, in the film, the um, uh, university is connected, issue potentially all the student cards as European cards. It's not just f focusing on one category of students. All students receive the card with the logo. Then if they don't want to use it, if they don't want to be uh, uh, registered on the platform because they say I will never use, I will never have uh, an international mobility. Okay, but from the beginning they have an incentive which is on the card they know that uh, uh, being a student in Europe is being a European student and it's a very important symbol. I would say. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Jean-Pierre Rumegas from the CNUS. And I think this also highlights that, you know, there has been projects that initially were maybe developed in parallel, but now through the last year have converged and are already collaborating and are also trying to use the same digital infrastructure, even though in principle they do different things. I think it's very clear how they can collaborate and contribute with each other and from each other. Um, so it's good to see that the European Student Card uh, is one of these projects which has a lot of political cloud and is now also collaborating with Erasmus without paper. This brings me to my next spe uh, speaker, uh, Christina Elmar from UNIT, and she will tell us about two other projects that are already collaborating or will in a very short time start collaborating uh, with Erasmus without paper. Christina, the floor is yours. Would you like to stand there here? I'll let you. Microphones are working? Yeah, you hear me right? Yes. yes. So, um, yeah, I come from UNIT, which is a Norwegian directorate. Uh, we used to be called CERES on the slide from Paul uh, earlier today. So we've been part of a lot of these EU uh, Erasmus pro, uh, projects for a long time. Uh, and we're a partner as well in the EWP project. Um, and today I'm going to say a few words about the MREX uh, project. Uh, it used to be also uh, Erasmus Plus projects and that are now in regular production um, as a network and as technical solutions. 
So um, Emrex is a general solution to enable students or former students to share and access their educational data, especially data about their uh, courses, their grades, uh, their diplomas, uh, and so forth. It's a, an open network um, where the owner of the results, so the student or the former student, is the one that is accessing their data and sharing their data with other institutions or workplaces or whomever they want to share their data with. And, and the AMREX network is really focused on uh, security and it was really important for us that this network was GDPR compliant. And the whole uh, sharing um, of data is based on a standardized format, uh, the ELMO format, um, which uh, enables the sharing of diplomas, uh, soon diploma supplements, and also transcript records. Um, so, and that is the same standardized format that is also used as part in the EWP projects. Um, the vision of the MREX network and the technical solutions is that we want to enable digitalization of any process in need of assessment data before, during, and after studies. So we want people that have studied somewhere or different places around the world to be able to access their data from different countries and transporting them and having control of them and sharing them with them across their lifespan. So for us, MREX and the sharing of student data goes way beyond mobility. It needs to be accessible also afterwards for if you apply for admissions or if you are applying for jobs or if someone needs to evaluate or your credentials to see if they're, uh, to see if they're valid or if they need to, uh, authorize, uh, to, yeah, to check their validity. So um, as you probably can see, there's a lot of similar, uh, similar ambitions with other projects as well. But this, I think what we're trying to see in the, in the MREX project is that it needs to go beyond mobility. And then I'm also going to say a few words about the ESMO project, which has been mentioned a couple of times over the past two days. This is a CEF project, so Connecting Europe facility. And we're a partner here as well. And, and the reason why this project started is that we, we are dealing with the implementation of ADAS, EIDs, um, and we are trying to do this implementation in the services we provide for uh, admissions and other student administration services. And the project is trying to extend the EID, um, EIDAS uh, authentication to include what uh, Janina uh, said or called sector or educational specific attributes. So get more data, not just the regular data that is part of the EID. We want to have to get connected and to be able to share more specific data that can be interested for, interesting for people when they are applying for admissions or when they're going abroad for mobility. And uh, we've dealt with some problems in the project. Uh, we figured out that the e EIDAS wasn't necessarily ready to handle uh, this sort of exchange of data. So we need an alternative approach um, in the project. So then we looked to the EWP project and the infrastructure built there to see if we can reuse some of the technical solutions that are working there and some of the logic in this project to, to build on that and also to secure more or better sustainability for this project as well. Um, it's still ongoing. Uh, it's a bit experimental at the moment, but we already have some results. Um, so for instance, in Norway, we are currently implementing uh, EID authentication into all our web applications used for students. So for admissions and for student administrations and for nominations, I think, as well. Um, and we will reuse all these technical uh, infra uh, infrastructure to, uh, to implement them in the MREX clients we are using as well. So we are really trying to, to connect all these different projects we are a part of. So, um, and I would like to end with a few words about cooperation. Um, 
because what we see when we're dealing with or being a partner in all these different projects and, and looking at everything that is happening in so many different Erasmus pro projects and SEF projects is that we have so many similar needs or goals. And for instance, for these three projects, uh, included the EWP, we, we use more or less the same data standard. We use the ELMA standard. Um, and we should definitely cooperate to further develop this standard. So there is this, we can communicate with one another. And we also, also need to make this a standard that other projects in the future can use so they will be interconnected. And as Janina also said, there's a definite need of a common registry. So we don't, in every project, have our own registry that we are spending a lot of time uh, refreshing and maintaining. Um, and I also think we have a lot of similar needs in regards to dissemination. Uh, we have, to a large extent, the same stakeholders, especially at the higher education institution, national agencies, and other governmental agencies. Um, and I think it will be very wise that all these similar projects disseminate together in one way or another so we doesn't compete because I don't think competition between these projects is very good for sustainability. We need to cooperate and we need to create user-friendly and holistic ecosystems of IT tools so that the universities, employees and the students and the staff, academic staff, get the best tools and the best uh, systems to help them in their day-to-day -day life, day-to-day -day studies and and life beyond studies. So, yeah. Thank you so very much, Christina. So, yet another tool that you've seen really converges and, uh, well, even though it's a little bit technical, I, I hope it really highlights the strengths of working not top down but bottom up and having the sector collaborate and working together to strive for a similar goal, which is digitalization of systems and working together on an infrastructure that as we've seen with these two projects and also with the Agracons project that I mentioned earlier can use the same infrastructure have similar targets similar dissemination so it is really uh, good to collaborate and, and I think we're on a very good way towards this now I want to show one more project, which is a project that is, well, actually, Paul should do this presentation, but I'm just taking his spotlight now, is led by the University of Ghent, which is called Aquatic. And as you can tell from the name, Online Quality Assessment Tool for International Cooperation. So what this tool does is that it allows to measure the quality of university partnerships. All of you, you have inter-institutional agreements. I know when we did the desk research as part of this project, we saw that some institutions have more than 2,000, some few institutions even more than 3,000 institutional partnerships. And very seldomly they know what is the quality of these partners. So this project is trying to use existing data. So for example, data that comes from the participant reports of Erasmus+, Plus, but also data that you have, for example, the data that you upload into the Mobility Tool Plus, to analyze the quality of your current partnerships. And let me be a little bit more concrete. If you, for example, have 1,000 university partners and you send Erasmus students to most of them, do you know in which institutions your Erasmus students get the best recognition? Or maybe which institutions give the least recognition to your students? These are questions that I think every, every international relations office should ask itself and we try to build a tool that can support this and give sort of a visualization of some of these elements of quality of uh, university partnerships and then helps you to really do data informed policy decisions. We all are only two years away from the next program. So all of us, we will have to at one point or another renew our partnerships. And it's very common that this is done sort of now in the next two years, uh, renewing bilateral agreements, inter-institutional agreements, if you have multilateral partnerships, but you will probably have to renew them. So it's maybe a good moment to think about how do we analyze these. Now what has all of this to do with Erasmus without paper? At the moment, the way the tool works is that it uses the data that you upload to the Mobility Tool Plus but you still have to manually upload the same data also to the Aquatic tool. Of course, our idea is to use Aquatic and Erasmus without paper and once again create convergence so that 
if the data anyway already exists, for example in the dashboard or in one of the other tools that is connected to Erasmus Wizard Paper, you could simply visualize some of this data and really get incredibly important statistics. What is your mobility flows? How well do your students perform? Which partners are good partners? Which partners need to improve? So this kind of data is incredibly valuable and we hope that we can sort of converge these two projects as well and within the next year bring them together so that these things can be more automated and support you also in, in this sort of decision-making processes that will have to come before the next uh, Erasmus program program starts. Now, let me conclude by saying that I've shown a few projects that we already collaborate with. Even though yesterday was the launch, a lot of these collaborations are already happening, both on a technical but also on a political level. And let me wrap up by saying that, well, it's not only these projects, but there is a lot of chances, a lot of opportunities with Erasmus Without Paper and the digitalization of our higher education systems. I put these kind of four topics here and I would like to conclude saying, well, there is mobility software which we can connect, which I think is an obvious use case. We've all seen now how different mobility software can connect. But also the infrastructure that we have built with Erasmus Without Paper, this registry and this data standard is something that we have discussed really for a very long time with the technical teams of Erasmus Without Paper and it has become evident that it is not only for Erasmus Mobility. The data format, the infrastructure that we, we have created can now be used by other systems that have different use cases simply because it is secure and from its logic of being a decentralized system being a telephone book, a registry, and allowing communication between systems is something that can be used amongst other, yeah, other oper systems, other uh, operations. And then, of course, yesterday we also talked about the Open Source University Alliance. So if you have, for example, software, even though it's maybe not mobility software, but software at your institution, there might be an opportunity that in the future we want to write more APIs in Erasmus Without Paper to connect different things and don't make it Erasmus Without Paper but higher education without paper. So that we can make sure that slowly we use Erasmus as an example or an exemplary uh, process of digitalization and bring other processes in higher education in the digital age, not only Erasmus in, in itself. And then lastly, and I think it's something that we always neglect a little bit and I, I just said it, but I want to repeat it once again, data-enabled policy making. A lot of decisions nowadays in higher education, and every one of you that works in higher education knows this, is done very often out of gut feeling or sort of, you know, let's see, we, we can probably figure out who's our best partner and what collaboration we need and, you know, how do we design our degrees. Digitalization is not only, even though it's very important, and I think we highlighted this throughout the last yeah, one, one and a half days, is of course about mobility and making it easier on the administrators, making better quality for students, but it is also about data. When we have big number or big amount of data, we can measure things that we can't even imagine yet. Why are Google, Facebook and so on all free? Because they use data, and they use this data to make decisions on political issues, on issues that are so relevant that if we think we have all the data about Erasmus, we can understand much better what, how interculturality works and we can give all this data to researchers at our institution. You see, I'm dreaming a little bit big and into the future. But I want us to be aware that the digitalization is not only about administration, it's also about data. And data-driven decision-making should be the goal of every institution that wants to strive for excellence. So with this being said, I conclude, and I did something which Paul just said, we shouldn't put emails on our slides. I put my email there. Uh, you can feel free to write to me, but uh, this being said, I think I already went a little bit above uh, my time. Thank you so much to uh, our speakers, and uh, thank you for your attention. You announce a coffee break, maybe?
I have one more practi practical announcement. Many of you already asked about presentations. You saw the link to the website. There's a, on the website, there's a tab Competence Center. There you will find downloads, and we will try to upload it as soon as possible before the weekend. Um, so, so you have all presentations available. The next session, and I won't talk too much about it because Valère will, will uh, be the moderator of the session, is uh, EWP as the new norm for third party, party solutions, question mark. Valère, you, you will introduce the panelists. Yes, shall I do so? Okay, so we have a very distinguished panel today. Uh, uh, Gerald Mauberger from uh, Mobility Online, SOP. We have Girish from uh, QS Unisolution, who, is, uh, who are responsible for Move On. We have Carmen from Spain, Sigma. We have, of course, Janina, our technical leader with uh, Muci in, um, in uh, Poland. And we have Ruud Haverlech, who is from Osiris, which is a Dutch uh, system. We, and he is like the new guy on t in town. Uh, they, are, they can look at it from a point of view. We are now going to enter, uh, whereas the others are already doing it. Okay. So I would like each of you to say, just in two minutes, more or less, what do you think of this whole process? What, how did you make the decision? Uh, how important is it to you? Uh, what do you see your clients are doing? Whatever you like, you don't have to deal all of it but some of it, okay? And then uh, we will have questions, okay? Good. Gerald? I thought. So, yeah, everybody can hear me. Hello again. Uh, my name is Gerald Mauberger. I'm the managing director of the Austrian company SOP, and we are the providers of uh, mobility online. Um, I hope that most of you already know us, know mobility online as a software for international relation offices. Um, we had, uh, or we have been uh, one of the first uh, participants in this in this project when we started years ago. So Valère contacted me, and 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 I saw, okay, there is a good solution in maybe in the future. Uh, at the very beginning, uh, I thought it was a let's say nice feature to our software, yeah, and nice add-on. And yeah, if we have it, maybe we have another uh, sales point, a sales advantage to offer this. Uh, in the meantime, I have to say, it's a little bit a must, a must have as a software provider uh, because we get a lot of questions. Do you offer EWP? And as you saw it yesterday, uh, Mobility Online can al already answer this question with a clear yes. So we have implemented most of the APIs already. Uh, what you saw yesterday, uh, from our client, University of Bremen, is already available for all our clients right now. So maybe a short question, how many mobility online users do we have here today? Hands up. So perfect. Congratulations, because you can already use it. What you saw yesterday on the test environment, and everybody of you has one, uh, can be uh, used immediately. So we, uh, we sent some emails out a uh, month ago and asked for heroes presenting uh, the EWP uh, software here, we found one, but we still need other heroes because it has to be a little bit a uh, tryout. Yeah, because uh, uh, you will not get instructions from a higher level somewhere who will inform you and say, "Now you have to use." Yeah, it's something that you, as a university or you, as an international uh, relation office, you should decide this by yourself because you are already working with all this data. You have it already, so it's not the question is it allowed to exchange it, in my opinion. You can just do it, and you have now the possibility to do it, and yeah, try it out. Yeah, and as, as a conclusion for us, it's still uh, very important to be part of this, uh, of this project, and uh, yes, I see a very good future for it. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Girish. Yeah, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I had the products at QS Initial Solution for Move On. Uh, Erasmus, as a, uh, without paper as a concept, uh, as far as is, uh, Erasmus without problem for the IRO. Uh, we've been uh, sold on this concept long before, before uh, probably when Erasmus came in. We had something called e-nomination in our uh, product. Uh, we built it up to a certain level in that. Uh, so we, we completely agree with this. I think this, this, this has to be the future because uh, I think I saw another uh, picture that was shown initially in the first uh, session, first uh, couple of sessions, a lot of paper at the desk. Uh, and for that to uh, I mean, disappear, I think this is a very important step. 
Uh, and as I said, uh, uh, there are a whole lot of problems that can be solved. I mean, one of the, uh, the biggest problem is the speed. Uh, I think someone used the word electron yesterday. Uh, definitely that's something uh, that's going to be there. Uh, correctness of the data, uh, the ability to be a little more agile, not be uh, rigid with your students, uh, to you know, submit things by a certain time and have that flexibility because it's all digital now. You don't have to wait for the mail to go in and mail to come in back. Uh, I think uh, all this is something that's uh, uh, definitely helpful. I'll end by saying uh, uh, three points. You know, it's, for anything like this, uh, people, process, and product. A product may be called IT here, and process probably called culture. Uh, that's what the word used here. All these through have to come up uh, on a simultaneous level. Uh, till all of them balance in some way, uh, there'll be a bit of uh, ifs and buts, issues. Uh, but I think uh, uh, this is the right step, yeah. OK, thank you very much. Carmen? Hello. Can you listen to me? Yeah? Yes. Well, um, Sigma is a uh, student information, information system that covers all the needs that the university needs to, to manage the, the processes, the academic processes. And we include the uh, processes, the management of processes of mobility. And uh, well, for us this uh, project is um, important because we, uh, for a long time, we are working with our clients, with our institutions, partners, um, in to have uh, better uh, processes, more efficient. And we think, we understand that paper is a good tool to, um, to have more, uh, um, um, manage, to manage the mobility more efficient. And for this reason, we are in this project uh, since the beginning. <clears throat> in fact, when we present the, the pilot to our, our clients, our institutions partner, they are very, very happy with the solution because they say that with the same uh, solution that they have now, they can uh, exchange information with other institution just pressing a button. And for this reason, we, we think that uh, it's uh, important to be here and to be part of the, uh, this project. OK, thank you. OK. Uh, in fact, you have already heard about uh, USOS, and you have seen even the screenshot from USOS. And you know that USOS is the student information system which is used by the University of Warsaw. This is not the whole story. The same system is used by 60 universities in Poland. There is a consortium uh, which was uh, uh, launched by the universities and the main goal of this consortium is to uh, produce a system by universities for universities. So the university decided to produce the system by themselves. And I run, uh, I'm the product, product leader of this system. <coughs> Uh, so, uh, well, we of course built um, EWP uh, interface for uh, in the system. It is now fully uh, operational. Uh, yesterday, as uh, yesterday, uh, the node has been put into production in the University of Warsaw. So, starting from today, we may start uh, exchanging production data with the partners. So now the real work starts <laughs> because uh, we are technically ready, but now we have to make our end users ready to use the tool uh, we have uh, uh, developed for them. And uh, we have some plans for the coming year. Uh, I, have already had, I have already took part in a couple of conferences inside Poland showing what we are uh, planning to do. Uh, the next year, somewhere in May, there will be a, a big conference inside Poland organized by the national agency uh, where all the IROs will be invited and uh, the new uh, digitalized ways of uh, handling mobilities will be shown to them. Uh, and uh, we will just start cooperating inside and uh, uh, showing uh, the partners inside Poland that the tool is there and they will just 
have to um, break this mental barrier and start using the system because the system will be there. They already, in fact, have what the University of Warsaw has. So now this is the question just of the decision of the higher authorities and then the end users which will not be aware, uh, which not afraid of pushing those buttons because <laughs> that's it. Thank you. It's slightly outside of you at the yeah. moment, but <laughs> still very interesting. That's uh, Thank you for the invitation um, to sit at this table. Um, for those of you who don't know uh, Osiris, let me introduce it uh, a bit first. Um, Osiris is a Dutch uh, student information system. Am I too far? Okay, thank you. A Dutch uh, student information system, which was originally uh, created for one of the universities uh, in the Netherlands, the University of Utrecht. Um, and that was in the year 2000, and after that it became, uh, um, became a success and uh, more uh, higher education institutes in the Netherlands in summer uh, outside started using it. We are now at 36 uh, institutions covering over uh, 400,000 students in the Netherlands. Um, and me, my, uh, myself, I am product manager of OSIRIS application, which is one of the, the modules of OSIRIS. Um, and part of um, the, the target audience for uh, Osiris application are not only exchange, to exchange students, but also degree-seeking students. Um, so many of our customers use uh, Osiris application to cover um, exchange programs, uh, Erasmus Plus, for instance, mainly. Um, and from the start in 2007, uh, we felt the need to exchange uh, information, um, but there wasn't a, a suitable platform at that time. So when uh, Erasmus Without Paper came into view, we were very excited that this was, was going to happen, because that's exactly the, the sort of platform I think uh, in these days uh, we need now. So we were very excited to uh, to join the network and to start implementing uh, the APIs in 2019. Okay, thank you very much. So this is the general view of all the people. Let me point out again, and this should be very clear, that you have a difference between those providers who provide the student information system, which basically does the whole administration of the university and which may or may not include specific mobility uh, modules which can then either done in-house or from a third party provider. So you have to make the difference between the overall student information system uh, which may include mobility modules or, or mod mobility modules on their own. Actually we have more representations here but not on the table. Uh, there is Cineca in, uh, in um, uh, Italy which is cooperating with us. Um, FS in Norway is, has now committed to implement uh, everything for the Norwegian universities by the end of 2019. Um, there is a high interest and also representative today of Terra Dota, the American firm who wants to go onto the, Amer uh, the European market. Uh, we have Solenova, uh, who is uh, a Finnish provider who is interested. Uh, and also Kion Turkey has uh, now indicated that they, they want to do something about that. Just to give you an idea that the community of Erasmus Without Paper is actually going on. First of all, before I ask any questions, is there anyone who wants to ask a question already here about to them something? Because of course you are the people who are going to use it. Any question that you want to ask any of these people yet? If there is, raise your hand and either I will come to you or you can shout out, whatever. So I will start with my own questions. Uh, one of the first questions I would like to know is um, implementing EWP, has it been terribly difficult or has it been easy? Did you have to change some of your concepts or was it from the beginning something that you were going to do or ready to do? Doing? Who wants to answer that one? Yeah. <laughs> Not in the same way. Sorry. So, because we have been 
participating from the very beginning on it was for us uh, also kind of uh, creation of the of the interfaces and everything so uh, I'm not the technical guy but Georg my colleague has done a lot of work and yes it is a lot of work so but I think it has improved because now we have already uh, finished connectors and examples and everything so I think for the new participants it will become uh, less less work to do but still it's it's a technical thing mm -hmm. so that's maybe something that some universities are afraid of, that, that uh, they do not have the, the, the resources for doing this. Yeah. But that's the reason why we are here. <laughs> okay. Anyone else who wants to comment this? Is? Yeah, I mean, uh, for us, I think uh, more than uh, the act of implementing those APIs, it was to figure out how do we include those things without disturbing the way it's happening currently. Uh, I think one of the examples while we were doing this trial uh, day before yesterday is like uh, the duration of the Erasmus, I mean, the mobility. I mean, is it in weeks? In some some products have in weeks, some have in days, some have in months. I mean, this is small uh, stuff. But then uh, the fact is uh, there are certain concerns, uh, certain clients that we interacted have. Uh, some of them not are completely aware what does Erasmus can do. Some of them are scared that their entire data may go to the other partner institution. Uh, so uh, it was trying to understand, or we took some time to understand how do we ensure uh, the existing ways still continue, uh, but at the same time, uh, uh, the, the, the partners or the clients who want to use Erasmus try out with at least some of their partners uh, can work in parallel. And that would create two different processes for, for them because uh, for majority of our clients, uh, it's the, the cooperation is not uh, with universities within Europe. It's also outside of uh, Europe, right? So having two different processes, uh, uh, even though there's slight difference now, but having more defined two different processes, uh, all that is a question mark that they have. So how do we make sure we let both happen was the biggest concern that we had. I think implementing is the, the fastest, part, fastest part once we decide. But deciding how do we go is, is the, I think, the toughest. Okay. Anyone else who wants to comment on this? Yeah. Uh, I might add something to it. Uh, well, what, uh, on the one hand, you may say that Erasmus Plus is the same for everybody, right? There are some procedures, there are some recommendations, so it should look uh, the same in every institution. But it does not. <laughs> and uh, not only processes differ, but also data you keep about your mobilities in your database, if you already do that already, differ. So uh, when you start uh, exchanging data uh, with your partner, you're all, you all of a sudden see that, okay, what I thought that is quite natural, for example, to keep the date of the, uh, the date of signing the agreement bilateral between institutions. So natural that I keep such a date in my database, but my partner does not regard this as natural. So what should I do? In my case, this, uh, this field in the database is mandatory, so I have to have it. Uh, I will not be able to store the record without that data. What should I do? Should I change my database or should I ask my partner to send something, uh, um, um, something, uh, well, different maybe, which will uh, can be regarded as a signing day. So uh, there are some s such small details which, uh, well, you, when you start designing, when you start implementing, for you are quite natural, but then you learn that, well, you have to uh, look into what, you, what is natural for your partner. And uh, only when you start really using the system, you will see those differences. That means that it's quite, often, quite uh, uh, possible that our APIs will have to be upgraded because of that. And that's okay, that's okay, we are open to that. Uh, uh, important is that you will start looking into those specific specifications as soon as possible and start talking with us as soon as possible so we will get the specification ready for you uh, before you start using it. So just, you're, we open, we, we invite you for, uh, for common discussions about how what is the best way to, to exchange data. Okay. Anyone else? No? Okay. Any questions so far? So, of course, you can hear it. Now is your chance to help 
develop the software of all these people as well. So it's important to see that it's also a, a bottom-up approach rather than just a top-down approach. Um, even if we have theoretically many universities, up to 700 already in the system, just by counting all the different uh, users, this doesn't actually mean that each of these users are going to use it eh, in practice. How do you intend to make sure that your clients are actually going to use the EWP software? Do you have anything in place or do you, are you going to do anything special in that respect? Who wants to answer that? <laughs> the same <laughs> direction. Uh, well, of course, we are planning and trying to convince our customers to use it as, as, as soon as possible. But very often, of course, there is the question, okay, are there any partners available already? So for Marshall, for example, it's, it's good that you have set it to productive environment, but if there is no echo on the other side, then of course uh, we have a problem. For this reason, uh, we, with Mobility Online, we already uh, developed also a part of a software for you to check who is available right now. So I have, we have prepared a, a, a smaller version of Mobility Online for those who just want to check, okay, should I uh, participate? Uh, I have some uh, QR codes here on a sheet of paper if you want to see this page and check out when I fill in my Erasmus code is, is are there partners already available in the EWP network then please take this one afterwards but for mobility online of course we will start already in the next week that we inform our clients okay now we are up and ready now this is an instruction this is a documentation how to start the process how to make the customization for offering your data to others but of course we have to ask you to get in contact maybe with partners of yours where you can find uh, they are also available via EWP that you, that you have a, a counterpart to say, okay, let's, let's test it together. So you are a partner, we both maybe uh, are already using Mobility Online, for example, then you can, of course, already interchange the data. So it is there, but of course we need your help. And we can, what we can do is only to give you the information, to give you the documentation, to give you the help, but still you have to be the hero, not we. Okay. Well, uh, I think uh, uh, there are multiple things to be done, and one of the things is what Janina said. A decision has to be made at, at certain level uh, within the university for the usage, uh, but that's definitely outside our scope. Uh, but what we are trying to uh, do is to make sure, uh, as I said, uh, it's not only the partners within Erasmus, it's also outside of it. We're trying to make sure uh, the work at IRO is in a way <coughs> Uh, that's simple, uh, you don't have to bother whether it's Erasmus or outside of Erasmus. Uh, we're trying to do, uh, look, looking at some, some concepts on that, that, that front and uh, uh, hopefully that would make sure uh, that you, know, you use Erasmus uh, in some sense, right? Uh, so we're trying to look from that perspective uh, till everything else comes up, you know, decision happens, uh, peer pressure, people start using it and all that. Uh, but from a product perspective, uh, I think uh, we're trying to make sure uh, it's just simple e-nomination process where it's Erasmus, if it's fine, the tool will take it take the, the right way. If it's not, the tool will do the other way to it. Yeah. Okay. Any further? Yeah. Well, in, in our case, Maria is easier than them because we have 25 uh, clients only in Spain. Um, and, uh, well, as we work is that we, we work very closely with our clients. We explain then uh, how how the project will work, how we show them uh, a prototype, and they approve this prototype. That we involve them in all the process, in all the decisions that we made about how we uh, will integrate Erasmus with our paper with the mobility, because um, the universities that work with uh, with SIMA, they used to work in, on that way, yeah? And well, at the beginning of the, of the year, we are preparing um, another meeting with them in order to explain and, and show, no, for showing the, the solution working and, uh, well, trying to convince them that, I think that they are convinced, but trying to convince them that uh, this is a, a project that if, um, if we don't use it, if uh, there are not uh, a lot of universities involved, 
it's not very uh, um, very useful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We need a lot of universities that work and that change information with uh, this network. I think that is the most important point to the to our universities to understand that this is the the way. Okay. Oh, good. So my, if I may uh, respond to that. Um, what I think is, well, of course, uh, getting the partners um, to use uh, EWP is up to the <coughs> higher in education institutes themselves. What we intend to do with OSIRIS is to make um, use of EWP as low, uh, the entrance as low level as possible. So um, I imagine, but we have to start uh, implementing it yet, I can imagine that it will be EWP or if it's not available, then an another solution. So I believe EWP will actually sell itself because um, using EWP will uh, decrease the amount of work needed to perform the exchange. So I think that's the, the, the best way to sell uh, EWP because to show the ease of use. Yes, it's also important to realize that, of course, some of these providers have been in the project from the very beginning. There has been some project funds, but most of the development work had to be done from their own resources, because as you all know, Erasmus Plus projects do not pay out so much anyway. And of course, a new provider like Osiris will actually have to do it from their own costs as well. So it is a big investment for these people as well. So uh, it's important to see that it is not just uh, Europe is financing all this and, and so on. It doesn't work like that. So that's important to realize. And anyone who wants to intervene now? Yes? Do you want the mic? Thank you very much. Um, Paria Mehmer, University, Technische Universität Kaiserslautern, Germany. Um, I have two questions. Um, we use a third party uh, solution and uh, we, have, uh, we have the service of um, RESOP. I'm so happy that we have this solution and uh, we don't have a self-made solution. So the first question is, as we have the service and uh, is it for us so important and essential to have um, our developers to ask them to do this um, API? Think, or it's not not so important but we can still do something that's the first one and the second one as you mentioned it is important to have um, partners partners in the system in the social media world it's like that that you get um, for example if you have use a messenger emo maybe when you see that your somebody in your contact book is now there in the system in this um, network you get an notification and you know okay he is also or she is there and I can contact this person to my understanding is it like that that we get also can have this option that to see if our partner is there and maybe um, he is using also this and this um, something like that that would be nice to have of course so I think the first question Gerald yeah. is it for you again <laughs> Okay, so first of all, I think there is still a kind of a misunderstanding in this yeah. way, yeah, because uh, it's very important to understand, and it's not only for mobility online, it's also for the others. The EWP functionality in third party providers like we are and our colleagues here from MoveOn, we have implemented or we are implementing all these APIs for you. So you don't need, as a third party uh, customer, you don't need the assistance from your IT. This is the good news, yeah? And the second one is, and it's still for free. That means we are doing all this workload for our clients and el enable you to, to interchange this data. So you don't have to go to your, to your IT department and ask them, uh, we will get in contact with you and we will show you how to start. And the second question is, again, uh, good to my sheet of paper here, it's, it's, it makes sense to, to check it out because uh, this is a network. That means you have, or we already know who are your partners. We also know as a software now, we are also knowing have, or have your partners already activated the EWP functionality in their system, independent if it's again Mobility Online or somebody else. And from this moment on, you will have in the list of your partner universities a nice green 
tick there and say, okay, they are now available for interchanging data. And then it's again your decision to say, do I want to interchange? Yeah? But that's, that's the freedom that you have. So I think it's a very good situation for you. You have nothing, as a, a customer of third party solutions, you have nothing to do, you have nothing to implement, you just have to activate it. And of course you have to trust that the other side is doing the same and, and that's how it works. We need, we need the partners because if we do not have these uh, partner universities starting with, then the network is not growing. Because for everybody it's more interesting if we have already 500 universities in this network than three. So that's, it's really, uh, it, it's on your side if this, or if it's possible that this network is growing very fast. Yeah, so again, please just, just start. And of course we keep you informed. Anyone else wants to add something? Yeah, uh, I think uh, the first point is, uh, other than trying out and uh, seeing the demo from the vendors, the respective vendors for you, uh, is, is to make a decision. Uh, uh, should we start using this, or, uh, or if we should we do some sort of trial? Because um, as he explained, uh, you don't have to implement anything. Uh, what you have to decide is you want to use it or not. And if you want to use it, uh, do you want to change certain things that's happening currently with you in terms of process, in terms of way it works? Uh, uh, if not, uh, I think those are the things that needs to be uh, decided. That at least from the third party vendors like us, you have a ready-made uh, stuff to be used. You need to make a decision to use it and then define uh, how I'm going to define. Because there are certain things that uh, in our experience we found there are certain things uh, our clients don't use it, right? Certain things that they need it. I mean, she gave an example of a data, right? Uh, where a particular data is required, date for in that example is not mandatory somewhere else. So how do we deal with all that, right? And uh, try out to do a trial phase, figure that out, and then, uh, yeah, uh, probably you should, you should make a decision to uh, continue using it in actual way. As a project, we will also try and keep up the lists of uh, universities who are using it, eh? not only in terms of the, 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 uh, the third party providers, but in general, uh, we still have to work out exactly how this uh, will happen, but we will make an effort to make this data available to you. Anyone else who wants to ask a question at this moment? Yeah? All right. Whoa, that was loud. <laughs> Hi, my name is Matt. I'm from Uppsala University, Sweden. Uh, the Erasmus program is, of course, an extremely successful and hugely important program, but at Uppsala it is representing less than half of our outbound mobility. And for you, uh, you have customers in Europe, but you also have customers in other countries. And EVP, uh, EWP, is of course requiring a lot of resources, and it's forcing you guys to change your developmental roadmaps. This is like a new <coughs> thing that is requiring you to make decisions. So I'm interested how are you presenting this as an added value for non-European customers? And for us, for our non-European exchanges, how are we going to benefit from this incredible development process that you're going through? So in other words, how can we go global? <laughs> well, if I can answer that. Uh, I think, Matt, uh, uh, the thought is, as, as, we, uh, as I uh, mentioned before, uh, IRO shouldn't be uh, thinking about, is this a partner who's within Erasmus? Should I send it via Erasmus network or through some other means? Uh, we believe uh, it should be simple uh, enough within IRO where they just send whatever they need to be sent. Right, the tool would have to be taken care uh, how, how it happens at the back end and based on other parameters. Uh, uh, but the, the point is uh, the same thing, whatever benefit that's been spoken here for last yesterday and all the sessions before this uh, would typically also apply to universities outside of Erasmus. Assuming, assuming uh, those universities outside of Erasmus have some tool which can uh, have this similar kind of conversation or interaction of uh, data. Uh, at least in move on, uh, we do have that capability. Uh, we don't have the ice cream sticks yet, but we can put a paper, uh, this Erasmus paper or some other indicator to uh, do that. But yes, uh, the idea is uh, you don't worry about 
how do I send the data or within Erasmus? You have a partner, you just communicate. Uh, that's the thought that uh, we have. And uh, I think that applies uh, even for folks who are outside of Erasmus network. So I'm not sure if I've answered, but uh, that's the thought. Okay. Yeah. Anina? Uh, in fact, because uh, we started with the European Commission money, so we have to obey the rules of the application and we have to support the uh, Erasmus Plus mobility inside the WP network. So that's for sure. Because of that, we have nominations, we have bilateral agreements and things like that. However, it doesn't mean that we cannot have the other APIs which will support the other processes so that you can... I already mentioned some plans about that. Why do I want to be able to uh, send the, the transcript of record to my partner without having nominations from that partner. Yes, because sometimes my partners are not nominating students because I, for example, got a free mover from some other university and now want to change the student achievement to that particular university. That's it, without nomination. So this is the question of uh, uh, what other APIs or services do we need to support other scenarios. And if you tell us, well, uh, what you offer is not enough for me, great, we will design something special for you. In fact, uh, uh, what was uh, designed as a mobility support was done during the WP1, the first of the project. Uh, the new uh, MT Plus APIs, which are totally different, were designed this year, and uh, whatever else has to be designed, uh, has to be designed, we will do that. Maybe you design yourself. Why not? Because uh, it's in GitHub. It's open. Yes, Gerald. Simple approach to this as well, because first of all, uh, let's start with this, what we have. So it's an improvement that a high majority of your uh, data are interchanged within the Erasmus Plus uh, area. And this was outside of Europe, uh, the reason or the, the, the topic. Uh, I think the, the fact that already Teradotta, for example, is here shows that others outside Europe are interested in this, not only to participate in the Erasmus Plus, but also to interchange other data. And it's not all limits to, to Erasmus. So you have partners, the information that is stored in their databases regarding their partners is the same that we have. There is an open interface for this, so I think there is already a chance to start at least with this part, with this data. Yeah? And what, what's coming then as a next is maybe we find a, of course, at, at the moment, for example, we are very limited based off the subject codes and everything, yeah? but maybe we find another way of a format that we can interchange and the agreements with them on a, in another way. Yeah? But at the moment, hey, we have a good start. There is already a high percentage then solved of exchange data. And if, and if we see that this is successful and this may, helps the universities, then I'm sure that we will find then the solutions for, for outside Europe as well. about um, we have to develop it, be moved that way. Uh, I think the, um, the, the, the amount of efficiency and quality enhancement that networks like EWP bring uh, justifies any, um, not any, but justifies to a large amount um, the, the efforts we do into implement, implementing them. So there's, I think there's a clear business case to start using it and to widen it up uh, outside Erasmus Plus. Just one more, uh, because it just uh, uh, reminded me that, well, there will also be other scenarios, not just mobility, like Erasmus Plus mobility. Uh, now, uh, now is the time when my university will uh, start collaborating with four other universities. So there will be five universities offering the same study program. Uh, Clementina, how is it called? This. Uh, uh, University Initiative. Oh, yeah. European, University Uni European University Initiative. And now you see what, is, what will be happening in the near future. We will have students which will do part of their studies in, inside of five universities. They will be our first target. We would like to be able to exchange student data uh, between those five, because otherwise, how can we manage administrative burden, uh, you know, having students going every semester somewhere else and, uh, uh, well, doing uh, the same program in, in, in those different places? We, yeah. we would, well. Okay. So the beauty of Erasmus, our paper, is that it is an open network that can exchange any data. 
and it is a question of designing new APIs and people implement it. Mm. And then you can exchange, you could exchange financial data about the grounds, people are asking about that, or you could exchange accommodation data or whatever. If you have an API to do it, it can be done. And sky is the limit. <laughs> the sky is the limit, <laughs> yes. We're almost at the end of this session. Is there any other question that any one of you would like to ask? Yes, there's one question there because it's more important that the questions come from you, of course. <laughs> uh, yes, hello, uh, Mira de Moor from uh, Artevelde University College in Ghent. We are a mobility online user. Um, I was wondering this, uh, well, about this yesterday, and then there was Janina mentioning uh, that lows and pipelines, but when I saw the live demo yesterday, and um, does it, will it imply a, a form of uniformity more? that everything will become the same because we for instance we don't have the step uh, that there is uh, a certificate of arrival we, we do not have that step so um, do you need our feedback to create other APIs or upgrading APIs and if so um, how many users will have to ask you that question just based on one or 50. As you, as you mentioned, yes, no one of our 200 clients have the same process and workflow. So we are, that's what we are, our daily business is to, to customize these. But uh, what we tried with EWP is to, to keep it very simple in a way. That means that the, the data, the, the basis of the data is a very standard one. First of all, that means you don't have to chair, uh, change any, any processes or so on. Because, for example, what we saw yesterday, this is a step in the process of a specific university. This university, university decided to want to uh, send this, this notification to the partner uh, regarding the arrival. But it's not a must. It's just a possibility. So that means you decide which information in such a nomination data you want to give back or retrieve from somebody. Yeah, so that's, it's, not, it's not a must for you to do this. It, it's just a possibility. And that's what we try to do, to offer you the possibility, but we do not force you to send any data that you don't want to or that, that you don't need to. Yeah? And that's, it's, it's, it's built so flexible yeah? that you decide, okay, this is the field that I want to send, this is the information that I want to give back, and this not. So you don't have to change anything or, or be worried about. Yes. So in theory, we started with the obligatory data are those the other ones that are actually identified in the ECTS user's guide. So the European Union wants certain data also for the mobility tool. Of course, you will have to provide those as well. Otherwise, you are not in line with the, with the program itself. That's what we start from. These are the obligatory data. And then there is a number of optional data which you use or you don't use. Of course, how far it will lead us is not totally clear yet, but the, everything can be extended. That's not the problem. Okay, I think we can leave it here unless there is anyone with a burning question now. I would like to thank my panel. I think it's been very interesting. I would like to thank, thank everyone for the cooperation. Um, so we can now move on to the next uh, session. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>
Um, the digital multi-signal market is, uh, is there to generate smart, sustainable and inclusive growth in Europe. And to do this, we invest uh, and we found via our diverse program, we found um, uh, innovative uh, digital solution and we invest in uh, key strategic technology such as artificial intelligence, blockchain uh, or virtual reality and we lay as well uh, solid ground for the infrastructure of the future, for example, 5G or supercomputers. So in a nutshell, we help um, European industries to, to compete on a world market and we um, give European citizens the opportunity to uh, take ownership of their digital future. And to do that, we invest in, uh, in education and skills um, and we make sure that uh, uh, cyber security has strengthened, that uh, we have trust and that we have a high level uh, of ethical standards that apply across the board. In particular, my unit uh, in DigiConnect uh, G2 is responsible for the support to digital culture and digital education. Uh, and as well for the take up of uh, interactive technology such as augmented and virtual reality. So I'm here to uh, present uh, the connected, Connecting Europe facility program uh, and as well uh, our support on the European student e-card. But before doing that, I will take two or maybe three minutes uh, presenting a bit the, the political context which is the digital single market. So the digital single market is one of the ten priorities uh, established by the current commission and the President Juncker presidency. Why do we need a digital single market? Well, we need that because um, the, the digital technologies and, and internet are, are transforming our world today. And, but uh, among the member states, we still have uh, barriers and um, citizens miss out on digital opportunities, don't have access to all the digital goods and digital services across the, the, the European market. We have industries and, and startups that have their horizon limited uh, and we have a government and public bodies that cannot fully benefit from all digital tools. So the objective of the digital single market is to bring down those barriers uh, in Europe, uh, to remove those unjustified uh, national regulatory walls, regular, reg, sorry, regulatory walls and to come from 28 markets to a single one. So uh, the overarching uh, objective of the single market, of the digital single market, is to, uh, um, is to promote the, the, the mobility, the free movement of person, service, capital, and data as well. So that um, uh, citizens and industries um, may access and uh, engage in uh, online activities uh, with a high level of, uh, under the condition of fair competition, a uh, high level of, um, of trust and with, uh, under the condition of uh, data, data protection, personal data protection and consumer data protection. So to the digital, the digital single market um, has uh, three pillars. Uh, the first one is better access for consumer and businesses to digital services and goods. And there we can have, as an example, the, the, the new geo-blocking uh, regulation uh, for e-commerce, where you can shop online across Europe without being redirected to, to, to a shop in another member state. Uh, we have the, the right environment as a second, pi as a second pillar, um, where um, we build high speed, um, secure and trustworthy infrastructure and services. Um, under the right regularity condition, regulatory condition, there we can think of uh, what we do in the Gigabit Society, 5G or Wi-Fi for EU. And we have as well, uh, we maximize uh, the potential growth in the data, the digital economy and the digital society. 
Uh, the digital single market was uh, reviewed uh, last year, uh, midterm, uh, to take stock of the achievements and three uh, area for further action were uh, identified, data economy, online platform and cyber security. So that's the political context. Um, and one of the tool or the instrument that we use in DigiConnect to uh, realize to achieve the digital single market is called CEF or Connecting Europe Facility Program. So this is a multi-annual program. It started in 2014 and it will end in 2020. And we share this program with uh, our colleague in DG Transport and DG Energy. So connecting your facilities is uh, and often we take this image, it's about building bridges in, in Europe, but not only physical bridges, uh, they can be as well digital. So uh, the CEF is all about the seamless interconnection and interoperability of services in Europe. So you have that in transport and energy, where uh, our colleague in those DG are responsible for um, developing the physical infrastructure and pipelines in those areas and uh, DigiConnect is responsible for the digital part. Um, CEF um, is funded uh, with about uh, 33 billion euro uh, for seven years uh, and telecom it's a bit more than one billion euro for the seven years. So in CEF Digital um, Safe Digital funds um, what we call digital service infrastructure uh, and those basically are uh, they, um, so digital service infrastructure and they offer services and solutions to businesses and end users but always with interconnection and interoperability across Europe in mind. We have two kinds of DSI, so digital uh, service infrastructure. We have what we call the sector specific uh, DSI and we've built DSI in, for example, the health sector or in justice, uh, in, in, in procurement, as well as in online dispute resolution. Um, and we have what we call uh, building blocks. And those building blocks, it's another type of DSI. They are not sector specific. Uh, but they offer solutions to uh, transversal, uh, so they offer transversal solutions. For example, uh, we have uh, those building blocks that has been uh, developed in, in CEF. Uh, we have the EID building block, which um, takes care of the mutual recognition of electronic identity across Europe and across member states. We have the e-delivery building block, which is about the secure exchange of documents. We have as well e-signature uh, yeah. e e uh, for uh, uh, trust services uh, across Europe, but, uh, and also e-translation for automatic translation. Uh, uh, so it offers tool for automatic translation. So every DSI, either the sector-specific DSI or the, the building block, they rely on a two-layer architecture approach. We have on one hand, we have the core service platform and we have the generic service. The core service platform, it's, uh, it's, it's the core of the service, it's the core of the DSI. Um, it could be either a central uh, information system or a piece of software, it depends. Uh, but usually it's what fulfills uh, the, the service and the needs uh, for that specific DSI. Um, so it, um, it integrates all the interoperability and security needs. We have as well the generic service platform and those are about connecting
support to the eCard initiative. So we, we, we join forces with, um, with our colleague in DG EAC, uh, EAC, so for education and culture, um, to bring all the solutions that we have in CEF, so the building blocks, but as well as the way we do DSI, to uh, the education sector. So we, um, so you know that, um, Um, so to the education sector. Um, sorry. So yes, so we, we bring so we come together with with ARC uh, on on the on the ECAD initiative uh, to uh, to bring all what we have in in CEF to to the ECAD. Um, and here um, uh, um, and what what we see where we see ourselves uh, DigiConnect is um, in helping the, the students to. Uh, identify this themselves in a trusted manner uh, across border and thus benefit from the once only principle in higher education. And here we are, uh, so here EID, one of the building block in CEF, is at the cornerstone at what we want to do. Um, because students need to be able to uh, authenticate, to use their own EID, so their national EID in any, bubbles, in any member states. Uh, and obviously one of the backbones, so the cornerstone of our uh, intervention here is the EDAS regulation. So, um, what we want to achieve uh, with, uh, with CEF is um, for, for students, we want to have um, uh, easier mobility between high education institutions. So we want to have a student that can seamlessly uh, uh, travel between uh, institutions, between universities, and be recognized across Europe uh, via EID. Uh, we have, uh, that would enable every uh, student to, to register themselves to the host university and to have access to all their services uh, at the time of arrival. And we would have as well for students access uh, to online, to academic and non-academic services. Uh, for example, uh, access to the cafeteria or to the library, or as well to private services that provide uh, discount to, to students. Um, because using EID, uh, and, uh, uh, and the EDAS uh, regulation, we have, we can recognize the status of, uh, or the identity of the person and the status of the student. Uh, for um, for uh, universities, um, that would reduce the administrative workload uh, and that would enable you to be more efficient and uh, uh, cost effective. So a word on the EDAS regulation. So digital identities are used uh, heavily in, in, uh, in the world now. So businesses use uh, millions of digital identities. Uh, but trust is a very key aspect of, uh, of it. So if we want to, to exchange seamlessly in, in, in Europe, we need to have that trust. So it's where the EDAS regulation come into place. Um, it's the EDAS regulation, uh, it's uh, the European regulation for uh, electronic identity and for uh, trust, trust uh, for online transactions. It requires public body to uh, allow citizens to use the national EID when they travel uh, and when they want to use that EID abroad. Um, 
and it uh, facilitated and secure and uh, facilitated secure and electronic transactions throughout the European, the European Union. Um, so we already found some some projects in in CEF uh, linked to uh, to uh, the e-card initiative. Uh, we have EID for you, which uh, aims at uh, extending extending uh, the EDAS framework uh, to get more attributes. Uh, and to be able to share those attributes or to uh, exchange those attributes through the EDAS uh, infrastructure. We have ESMO that we uh, discussed uh, already this morning. It's a safe project. Uh, and we have Studies Plus, which is, uh, uh, which is happening in Germany. Um, and they, they build uh, a whole ecosystem of service uh, backed by EID and by uh, EDAS. And we have two new calls for 2018. We have uh, My Academic ID, uh, where the aim here is to create a single uh, EID and to link this ID to um, EDUGAIN and to uh, ESC, so the European Student Card. And we have as well SEAL, uh, which, are, uh, which is about um, so boosting the safe EID adoption in, in, in Europe. Um, so those, as I said, are generic services to, uh, to EID. So EID is the core service platform, so this is the main functionality. And those five projects are there to, to promote and to, um, to promote the adoption of EID in the education sector. So for, for the future, so as I said, CEF is uh, until 2020. Uh, CEF is, uh, so is a funding program like, uh, like Erasmus. Uh, we work on, uh, so there are funding opportunities either via, uh, via call for tender or via call for, uh, for proposal. And this is coming to an end uh, in 2020. Uh, it will be replaced by what we call the Digital Europe Program where we will continue uh, our work on the, on the student e card initiative. So, uh, in a nutshell, so, um, so in a nutshell we have, so what I've just explained you, we have the digital single market uh, with the priority defined by the President Juncker. We have uh, one of the instruments to realize this digital market is CEF, Connecting Europe Facilities in which we have uh, a part on digital. And CEF is about connecting Europe together. So it's about building bridges and uh, making sure that uh, interoperability and a connection work in Europe. It could be applied to the education sector. We have started initiatives in that sense in 2017 with what we call the ECAD initiatives to have the EID building block, so the electronic identification uh, apply and promote it in the education, education sector um, in order to uh, enhance trust in online services uh, in university. And that could help in the Erasmus uh, program and in the European Student Cards Initiative. Merci. So thank you very much for this wider view of what is happening in Europe and in terms of uh, digital infrastructure. Anyone who has a question on this? We have a, a little bit of time for a question, perhaps. If not, then now it's the time to sort of wrap up a little bit. Uh, I think um, we've had a lot of people, very interested audience, uh, we had a lot of uh, presentations. Uh, today we were able to look behind the, the, uh, the scene a little bit in technical terms. Uh, and Janina showed that there are a lot, of us, a lot of things are going on that you as a user will probably not be aware of, but that information is available and can be used by everyone. And it's important to, 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 to see that. Uh, we've also seen how the various components can cooperate, uh, 
we have already established quite extensively that, for example, Ola and the dashboard will be fully integrated into um, Erasmus R paper, and that's one of the, the key elements of it. Uh, but in addition, there are new APIs which are being, which are being uh, worked out at the moment and which are going to enhance the capabilities of uh, Erasmus R paper even more. Uh, one of these is, for example, having transcript of records without recourse to, to the, 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 the whole cycle as such, and there are others as well. Janina has already shown some of that. Um, <clears throat> we have also seen how the EWP hub is like, hopes to become like a community where various projects, various pieces of software through the, uh, the uh, Open University Alliance, uh, Open Source University Alliance, can work together and can be exchanged. <clears throat> so, in a way, what we are creating is like an in educational ne uh, network. And this network can, in principle, exchange any data. So we have to be open to new uses, to new possibilities. And Janina was already referring to some of them yesterday when she talked about public dictionaries being available. Uh, for example, it's not always easy to remember all those country codes. Uh, for example, what's the country code for Switzerland in three letters? Uh, some people will definitely start hesitating, and I'm not even going to ask about Bosnia-Herzegovina. So, and yet all of these countries are directly or inter indirectly connected. This information is available all the time. We can make available such information through uh, Erasmus R paper as well, and that's important to remember. And as you've seen, it also fits within the framework of the European Digital Infrastructure, and CEF uh, is a very good example of how Europe as a whole is trying to, to, to build this infrastructure, make it easier, make it economically viable and also interesting. And this is the larger view. We are one sector, the educational sector, more specifically even higher education, but we have to see what's going on in other sectors and we have to align with them. And Erasmus R paper is also that. It's not only the project anymore that now deals with Erasmus Plus exchanges. It is, especially in the second year, especially in 2019, it's about much more. It's about reaching out to whatever we can make happen, whatever we can propose, and whatever we can find funding for. So that's important. So basically, Erasmus R paper is a network, a network that uses applications to link your information in your databases and make it available to outsiders. Of course, this has to be done in a transparent way, in a secure way. We said that yesterday. It also has to be, it has to lead to trust. It should be, we've had, we've had, had talk about trusted users, I have heard about trusted providers, but we have to have trust in it all. Actually, it is the keystone of Erasmus Plus itself. If you do not trust the courses taught in other institutions, then Erasmus Plus is not possible. This was the problem in the beginning. That's the basic problem still here and there in terms of recognition. Okay. A network like Erasmus R paper can help to build this trust, to make it secure, make it digital, and in this way, usher in a new era of exchanges of information, not only exchanges of information, but also looking at new processes, at changing existing processes, at taking into account the diversity that undoubtedly will still exist in the future. But it's not because we use the same data that we actually also have to have the same processes. It's the result that counts. It's the final data that count, not how you reach them or where you get them and so on exactly. So it has to be a multitude of possibilities. And I think, to be honest, and as a coordinator, I'm very proud of that. And I would like to thank everyone concerned here, the team, especially also Paul and Frederick as local organizers. They have been very generous to us as well. Uh, but also you, 
in helping to build this into something that everyone will be able to enjoy in the future. So thank you very much for that. And on this hopeful note, we are definitely going to change the future, I think. On this hopeful note, I would like to close this conference. Unless Paul has something practical to say anymore, no? So make sure you go to the reception desk, ask uh, for your uh, certificates if you need them. Make sure that if you want to be on the city tour, you're on the list. And otherwise, I would say enjoy Ghent, even though it's a bit chilly. And I wish you a very good trip home back. Thank you very much indeed.